the mouse, Peter. You might not want to. Um, it was working before. But yeah. You might be more comfortable just using the keyboard. Yeah, OK. Just a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to work. There it goes. So is it an infrared feed to the keyboard? Probably. OK. Well, thank you for um, coming uh, at this hour of the morning. and. Some of you dosed up on the sugar back there, so <laughs> we'll see if we can keep you awake. Uh, I want to talk about this subject here, principles of computing. This, this, this has actually been a subject of interest to me for a long time. I've always taken computer science very seriously, and I've always been sensitive to people asking the question, well, <clears throat> is computer science a science? And any field that calls itself a science like political science or social science can't be a science. Because if it was really a science, they wouldn't have to call attention to it. <laughs> okay, you've heard, you've heard all that talk before. So this, this, is, uh, this has always bothered me. I always thought I w was studying science, but a lot of my colleagues didn't think I was. When I started out my research career, I was a very productive researcher. In fact, uh, in today's terminology, I would be a superstar geek. Published lots of things, got lots of grants, stayed away from administration, criticized the department chair for stupidities, <laughs> criticized the dean for having his tie too tight, and all these kind of things. <laughs> and, and Bill, too, right? <laughs> But uh, then in 1979, I was asked to serve as department head here. Uh, this is kind of the next step. You know, you, you establish your geekhood, you move up a little bit in the world. So I, uh, this, this turned out to be a, a startling shock for me because one of the first things that happened was I started going to cocktail parties with other department chairs. You probably still do that, right? You have department chair cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing I noticed was that uh, at these cocktail parties, the other department chairs would go gather around the physics department chair, and they were fascinated with the stories that the physics department chair was telling them about what they do in physics. And then they'd cycle around, they'd come over to me, and they'd ask, what do you, what do, you do in computer science? So I'd try and tell them what we did in computer science, and 30 seconds later, they'd start wandering away, and they'd go back to physics. <laughs> So at first, I thought this was a communication problem. So I actually went out and I studied um, how scientists communicate with each other, say, through Scientific American or American Scientist. And I learned how to write in that style. And then I, armed with this new knowledge, I'd go to more cocktail parties, and the same thing would happen. <laughs> so finally, uh, I decided I needed a change of my perspective, which is why I went from Purdue to NASA Ames, so I could be in the middle of a different world of research, a different set of people trying to use computer science to advance state of the art. In that case, it was NASA trying to use computer science to advance aeronautics. And I learned all sorts of things, like you don't talk about numerical aerodynamic simulation if you want to sell it. You talk about flying an airplane inside a computer. Second one clicks more. So I began to learn a lot more about how to communicate by dealing with people in the other sciences. And I began to say, see from that setting that I was basically incompetent at talking about my field as a science, which is why when I was at the cocktail parties, people would wander away and go talk to the physicists who were very competent at this. Um, so this is this, ever since that time, ever since 1979, this has been a constant question for me, is how do we talk about computer science in a way that exposes the science that's in computer science in, and in such a way that other people will have no question that there's science going on there. And we can be proud of the fact we're doing science. And I actually think in the process of trying to formalize this in the last five years as a project, teach courses on it, organize an ACM committee to try and look into this, uh, that we have found that most of our colleagues in the field are, are as incompetent as I have been about communicating the, the science that we do. We've never had a conversation among ourselves about what do we think our scientific principles are. 
all the ACM curriculum recommendations to talk about a body of knowledge for a curriculum. The body of knowledge is kind of a list of core technologies, databases, n networks, operating systems, graphics. You go on and on. I actually found a list of about 30 of them. Just look in a typical catalog and you just count up the course titles. And it's very easy to see that we value our core technologies. But the problem with that is a lot of other people perceive us as only interested in technology and they keep expecting us to disappear as a field as soon as the technologies become obsolete. And somehow we regenerate ourselves and come up with more new technologies. But there's this perception out there that's more like watching a novice skier who's constantly trying to keep his balance and is about to crash into a tree. And they don't realize that underneath it there's some very solid principles. So I've been engaged in this thing here of trying to bring out the great principles. And in, in doing this, I've been inspired by people in the other sciences, like in uh, astronomy, Carl Sagan talked about the principles of astronomy. In physics, Feynman talked about the principles of physics. In the life sciences, Bob Hazen, one of my colleagues at George Mason University, has done very well talking about the principles of the life sciences. And so without any bashfulness, I borrowed one of his titles. Called it the, he had the great principles of science. I just said, let's call them the great principles of computing. And so what I'm going to do is describe this project a little bit for you. And I'm going to go through it kind of fast here. But uh, you'll see that there's quite a bit to this. And uh, I hope you'll see that there's some real, really interesting possibilities for the way you can approach a curriculum around this. So let's see what we can do here. So I think I just mentioned the first thing in this list, how I got interested in this. I also touched on why it's important for us to have such a framework so we can communicate ourselves effectively. And we can also distinguish technology things which become obsolete from fundamental principles which don't become obsolete. And I'll talk about a great principles framework for computing. I'll show you what, the, what it looks like. I want to talk about a couple of things that are hot topics today very briefly, like the enrollment problem that's been going on nationally. And it's connected with uh, a myth that a lot of people have about our field that we're a field of programmers. And this framework shows you why that has to be a myth, and it also shows you a way out. Another thing uh, that's turned out to be very important here is what I call storytelling. We can all of us sit down with a piece of paper and start writing down principles that we think we, sh we work with or we should teach. And I guarantee you that if you stood up in the cocktail party and said one of our fundamental principles is and pick out something from your list, you'll put people to sleep. Things that keep them interested are telling interesting stories about these things. We have a paucity, you like that word, a paucity of stories about our principles and who invented them and how they came to be invented. Or if you don't like the word invented, how they came to be discovered. So this is important. And if we have time, I'll talk about one of the principles of computing locality, which is the one I devoted my early research career and had 12 PhD students here working on, several of which already got an honor in previous years for being distinguished alumni, which I'm very proud of. Dorothy found this out for me. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> OK, so I uh, mentioned how I got interested in starting out here. I call it the cocktail party problem of the new department chair. I tried learning how to communicate in writing about our science and wrote so uh, computing columns for the American scientists for about, what is that, seven or eight years. Wrote 47 columns about different ideas in computer science, but tried to pitch them in ways that other scientists could understand them. And I purposely stayed away from a lot of programming ideas because it was so common for people to think about programming. I wanted to show them that there's a lot of other science going on that has nothing to do with programming. I mentioned this uh, when we were at NASA, 1983 to 91. We interacted, our job was to interact with NASA scientists and, and bring computer science as a component of the research in aeronautics. And we 
were constantly annoyed with NASA scientists who wanted to think of us as programmers and not researchers. And some of you probably have encountered the same thing today, not necessarily with NASA, but in, with other fields. And this, this is, a, to me, a manifestation, it was one of the early manifestations of the computer science equals programming myth. And this is something I've been worried about for a long time, and I think it's finally come to bite us today. As I mentioned, I got inspirations from Hazen, Feynman, and Sagan, and I started a project at George Mason University trying to learn how to teach this in 1997. The project has come to fruition at the postgraduate school. I mentioned that if you comb through our self-description of who we are, what we think computer science is about, you'll find long lists of core technologies. I'm not going to read all these to you. Here's a typical list of what computer scientists say they're, they're all about. If you look up in the ACM curriculum recommendations, there's a body of knowledge someplace. You'll mention all of these kind of things. If you look in a typical catalog, you'll see these kind of things. There's 30 of them up here. There's probably more that I missed. The point is that when we describe ourselves now, the way we tend to describe ourselves is with technologies that we work with. And if you're an outsider, it becomes hard to figure out what are the scientific principles. You, 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 you think you're talking with people who tinker with technologies, and they like experimenting, and they like gadgets. You say, where's the science? So that's so the objective of this, then, of what I've been about uh, in this project is articulating computer science in terms of fundamental principles. Now, when I've described this objective to other computer scientists, especially in the beginning stages of the project, they said, this is great. We think you're, this is a, the right thing to do. We, we, we ought, really ought to do this. And I say, fine, can you help out? And then they look at me very suspiciously and say, give me an example of a principle. And I always found that really amusing because I should be asking them for the example. So if I got a SPAF, I should be able to say, give me an example of a principle from the area of computer security, because you're the expert there. And he's kind of grilling me, like, what do you mean by a principle? Well, he, he never really did that himself. But, but I mean, this has happened. OK? So this is part of this. This is like we have never talked about our field like this. And people react like, what do you mean by a principle? Now, if you're at a cocktail party or you're in a conversation with somebody else, and they say, what do you do? And you say, well, we, we deal with fundamental principles of computation. And they say, what's a principle? And you can't answer the question. You just lost it. OK. So you should stay away from that mouse. Um, purpose, the benefits of doing this are three main kinds of benefits, uh, articulating a deep structure to our field communicating it to other people, and even to ourselves, and also answering certain philosophical questions which are actually coming up and becoming more important today. So deep structure is looking for things like fundamental principles that cut across technologies, looking for core practices, the things that define the practice of computer science, and also to take a look at the areas where we think we're not as strong as we ought to be and ask questions about how we can strengthen ourselves in these areas. For example, today, uh, a lot of people believe we've lost our luster in the area of experimental computer science. So how do we get that one strong again? In the area of communication, the benefits are we can see the whole of the field. We can reform our external image, which is mostly thinks of us as programmers and technologists. We can promote interaction with other fields and be successful at it, and we can inspire young people, especially if we concentrate on telling interesting stories about what we do. There are some interesting philosophical questions which are coming up today. For example, what is computation? Most people, I'll give you an example, most people believe that there's some, something going on with DNA. We can use DNA to compute things. But it's not an ordinary computing machine. So in order to be able to claim DNA computation works, People are looking at, are we looking at this issue. What do, what, do you mean, what do we mean by computation? So that we can claim that DNA is computing something. 
The second fundamental question is why are we a science? Where is our experimental method? These are connected. So there's a whole bunch of things. If we can come up with answers in a lot of these areas, there's a lot of benefits here. Now, when I um, myself approach this question of how to define what the principles are, I, I, as I reflected on this for a long time, I got I found myself being very confused between something like uh, what you might call a fundamental law. So you can write down a mathematical equation for something that says, here's how something works, and a design principle. Because you know we talk in software engineering like use modularity or use data, uh, data abstraction or use information hiding. And we claim that's a fundamental principle. The, 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 the ones that have to do with software design are not principles like f mathematical recurrences. They're principles of like human conduct. Software engineers, if you will please conduct yourself in the following way, you will almost assuredly produce better software. And that's different from saying F equals MA. So what I finally decided to do is say, well, let's distinguish these. So mechanics would be fundamental laws and recurrences of computing, and design would be professional social conventions for organizing computational systems that are simple, reliable, resilient, evolvable, and secure. Okay. Computing mechanics, the first category, deals with cause and effect relationships. You do this with a computing machine, you'll get that outcome. For example, if you ask to uh, print out all the numbers between uh, uh, all, all the 10 digit numbers, you're guaranteed to have a computation of at least two to the 100 steps. Okay? So, cause and effect, how computations work. Okay, we can all agree on that. And first take that many people have on what these mechanical things are is they can be expressed as declarative statements. For example, you could you make a statement like, Turing machine is a universal model of computation. Or all information can be encoded as strings of bits. Or the number of bits in a message source equals its entropy. So these are examples of declarative statements. Problem I found with these is a lot of people want to argue over them. Say, well, what do you mean by universal here? Or what, what's a model of computation? What is computation? Or information, what the heck do you mean by information? Because sometimes it appears subjective. So how do I tell when I'm looking? What, what, what do you mean by encoding information? Why bits? How long is the string? Uh, you, know, you get a lot of people want to argue over and I, that, to me that was taking us in the wrong direction. So I became interested in things like narrative stories where we could discuss them. So. We can have a story called the P and the NP issue, and we can talk about that. How, how was this discovered? What was discovered? Who did it? What breakthrough was there, et cetera. There's all sorts of interesting things to say. The story of microprogramming. The story of errors in representing numbers in a finite machine. The story of performance of computing systems and networks. So looking at how to tell the stories about this turns out to be much more productive. And there we find we're not very good about telling stories. <coughs> I like to draw a picture like there's a hexagon and around the edge of the hexagon I've labeled six categories. Did I miss something here? Let me just back up. Nope. I've labeled six categories of principles. There's, starting up at the top is computation, communication, coordination, you have to read upside down here. Recollection, evaluation, automation. Inside of the correct, uh, the, the hexagon is computing mechanics, all these fundamental recurrences. You can think that this is a six-sided building with windows looking in, not Microsoft windows, but just windows looking in here. Each window has a distinctive flavor to it, distinctive question that it asks. Uh, however, you can see, often see the same thing looking through, through in two different ways. An example of something you can see in two different ways is like the internet 
can be viewed as a communication medium. So when you look in through the communication window, you can talk, you can discuss how the internet moves data uh, reliably from one place to another. You can also look at the internet through its protocols, which are coordination issues. How do you coordinate different entities at different locations in the internet and get them to do things together? So there's a lot of things that are like that where you look at them through, you can look at them in different ways. So the, I guess, uh, what do we used to use terminology like mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive? That's not what this is. We're, these six categories of princi mechanical principles are not mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. There's six perspectives on the fundamental principles of mechanics, computing mechanics. <coughs> You got a blank page, okay, I'll live with that. Now, uh, one of the questions that comes up is, is this uh, complete in any sense? And I wanna argue that it is. So here's a typical basic model of a computer, the block diagram, which has a CPU memory and IO. We often call this the von Neumann model. Everybody's familiar with it, so it's a convenient way to start thinking about this. So there's a computing machine, the, at least, the old fashioned type of computing machine. This function here corresponds to computation. The memory function corresponds to recollection, meaning to recall that which has been previously stored. What's the IO correspond to? Communication. Communication. Now, we never build one computer anymore. What do we do? We build lots of computers that are on chips. We hook them up by network. So there's actually lots of computers around. So we have to deal with all whole bunches of them. So here's a whole bunch of computers. It's just a sample of a whole bunch of computers. And what's that? That's coordination. They all have to work together. Then if we look back a little larger, now we've got a network of communicators, uh, of, co of uh, computers coordinating. And we can ask the question, what can we get that system to do? That's automation. What can be automated by such a system? This is, uh, turns out to be a non-trivial set of questions there. And finally, uh, let's say you've even gone so far as to answer your, yourself on the question of what can be automated and what can you expect of this system as an automation system, your interest in performance questions like, does it do its job on time? How long does it do its, how long does it take to do its job? So we get into all sorts of evaluation questions. In fact, most, what we found is most of, most of the time when people design software systems or hardware systems, there's two fundamental questions on their mind. One is, does it work? And the other one is, does it produce answers in, soon enough that I can use them for something? So there's, there's always a correctness question and there's always a, performance question on people's minds. So evaluation is part of this. So there's, the point of all this is that these six areas correspond to six functional things that we normally think about when we talk about computers. And as far as I could tell, there aren't any other ones. That doesn't mean there aren't, I just haven't found them. Another check on this is we've taken a look at computing technologies and to see pick a computing technology like a computer chip and ask questions like, does this technology embody anything from communication, coordination, computation, et cetera? And every one of the technologies we've looked at, check, you check off something in all six of these. The weights and combinations are always different, but they all show up. So we think that this way of looking is, is complete. Here is uh, the first area. I'm just, I'm not gonna ask you to read all the fine print here, but there, there is fine print. Computation area is generally interested in the question of what can be computed and how, and what are the limits of computing? And here's uh, some of the areas that get studied under this that, are all, that all contain principles that we need to be aware of when we're answering this general question about what could be computed and how. And what are the limits? So you, you, if I've done my job right, you'll see many of your favorite topics listed down here in the fine print. 
So I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, you can read it. The slides will be available. Try it again. It's not going to let me switch over. Huh? There we go. Communication. No, that's the second one. Okay. Okay. Uh, communication. This deals with the general question of sending messages from one point to another. Now, notice that there's a notion of physicality in here. There's a place. There's physical places where information's moving. And sometimes we forget that computation is fundamentally physical. There's been lots of hype talk about, forget atoms, it's all bits. Bits are stored in physical places or, or in signals. So this is some <coughs> magnetic field, an optical thing, or some kind of electromagnetic wave or something. This, it's in a physical place, the bit is. And so we can actually talk about moving information from one place to another. Here are the kinds of things that you find discussed under this heading. You know, error correcting codes, Huffman codes, entropy, file compression, all comes in under here. Mobile com computing, cryptography, all different aspects of communication. Coordination is the third major area of, in here. It's also, some people prefer the name interaction, which is fine with me. You may no, have noticed that one of the criteria for being the title of an area is you have to end in I-O-N. So you, you know, in a lighter moment, we can call those the ions of computing mechanics. And if you pardon a little warping of language, we could say design in the form of design and get design as one of the fundamental principles. So here, the primary issue is we've got multiple entities cooperating towards a single result. And I put in parentheses with feedback because they, they have to interact in order to tell whether they're being successful at achieving their result. So there's lots of things in this area that we talk about. Basically, it falls, next picture clarifies it a little bit. I can get the <coughs> computer to, there we go. Seems to have a delay in there. <coughs> The uh, upper right corner refers to one way of looking at the way people carry out action. We, we have the terminology called action loop, where's an A and a B person. I guess the cryptographers call them Alice and Bob. They show up here in human computer interaction. But Alice and Bob, uh, Alice can make a request, Bob makes a promise, Bob delivers on the promise, Alice says she's satisfied. So there's an action loop that people go through all the time when they're doing simple requests with each other. So this is a human phenomenon that exists before computers exist. However, one of the things we do, so, so all coordination starts out being human to human. One of the things we've done in computing is we've provided, we support human, human coordination with systems. I call them human, human assisted systems. So they tr they're workflow systems. They track people doing work and help them move towards their goal of completion. There's a whole area of research that's opened up around this called computer-supported cooperative work. So th this is a big area of research. Computer scientists are actively engaged in it. However, that's not the only thing we do with human-human work. We often delegate some of that action. For example, we might take the B part, the producer part, I'm so yeah, Al Alice is asking Bob to do something, so Bob is producing. Take that and, and automate Bob. Give Bob over to a machine. So Alice is now interacting with a machine. So in that case, we call it human uh, computer interaction, HC. So that'd be like down here, human computer interaction. Here's Bob over here inside a computer. Here's Alice out there talking with Bob inside the computer, and they carry out tasks. And then finally, the th a third level of delegation is where you delegate even Alice to a computer. So there's an Alice and a Bob, and they, we talk about coordinating, coordinating them. This area has been called HCI, Human-Computer Interaction 
research area. And this area has been called concurrency. We do it in operating systems, networks, databases, concurrency control. So there's a lot in this area of coordination. The area of recollection deals basically with storage. Uh, storage is a fundamental part of computing systems. You have to st store data someplace. You have to represent data. And you have to retrieve it and to process it. So a lot of things that get come up under this heading of storing and retrieving information, hierarchies, locality, caching, address spaces, naming, sharing, representations. Here's a performance issue, thrashing. Retrieval issues by name or content, searching, consistency, all sorts of things. This, this is a hot topic in the, in, for Google, for example, is how to do uh, retrieval from the internet. <clears throat> this computer must go to sleep here. There we go. Automation. This area deals with performing human tasks by computer. Yeah, I suppose in general you can when you're trying to perform human tasks by computer, you, you can talk about issues like the correctness of the task that's being performed, the fit, the experimental assessment of the task, performance prediction and capacity. So anything that has to do with automation that uses computers could fall in this general category. But typically, in computer science, we tend to focus down here more than anywhere else. We focus on cognitive tasks. What, what kind of things that we normally associate with human intelligent behavior can we get a computer to do? So this brings up all sorts of things like cognitive science, artificial intelligence, Turing tests, uh, strong and weak AI, lots of things here, different types of systems for doing cognitive tasks like neural systems, Bayesian systems, agents, robots, etc. So a lot of, there's a lot of research and development going on in that area. Evaluation deals with the general question of how you predict when computations will deliver their results. So we're interested in the capacity of a system, networks, throughput, response time, congestion, uh, calculating things with a model, forecasting things with a model, et cetera. Use anything that's doing, anything that has to do with modeling and using a model instead of a computer would fall in this area. So those are the overview of the six main areas of mechanics. Now design, another important area. Here, uh, in, when we talk about design, we typically talk about architecture and process. So when we talk about design in an architectural sense, we're talking about how do you arrange components into systems? What are the relationships between the components? We talk about design as a process. We're talking about how we go about organizing our actions so that when we put together a system, it comes out the way we want. So there's the design process and the design result, if you want to call it that. I just use the term architecture and process here. Most design is oriented around trying to either architect a system or have a process or both that achieves most of these general objectives down here. Simplicity, performance, resilience, evolvability, and security. And some people like to add on safety for if you're dealing about critical software systems, they have to be safe. So these are concerns that drive design. Uh, there's all, again a list of design principles. You've seen them abstraction, information hiding, modules, encapsulation, blah, blah, blah. You've seen all these things. Well, one of the things that they all have in common is that you can think of them as social conventions, which have been worked out over a long period of time that, that we teach, try and teach our software engineers and we encourage them to follow because when they do follow, they tend to be much more successful at taking care of that list of concerns that design is trying to take care of. So there you have six mechanics areas and a design area. So we can say there's seven major areas of computing principles. Now, 
In addition to talking about principles, I like to talk about practices. Principles give us a conceptual framework. Practices talk about how we go about doing things. Principles are the knowing about. Practice is the doing. In the uh, area of computer science, there's looks like there's four fundamental core practices. And what I mean by fundamental core practices is if you claim to be a computer scientist and you can't do any one of those, other people are going to say, I don't believe you. Uh, you're not a complete professional. These practices are programming systems, modeling, and innovating. And there's an end endless cycle between principles and practices. You obviously apply principles and practice. The important thing about practices is that they're kind of a different dimension from principles. I know lots of people who know lots of principles, but they can't practice things. I have my own personal story I can tell. One day, uh, when I, was at, I came into REACTS one morning, maybe 1985, somewhere there, and the Unix network was down. And I was in there at 7 o'clock. And I was mad because I had to reboot the system. But I didn't have the super user password. So I had to fume about this for two hours until the system guy came in and rebooted the system. So I, I had come in early to get work done, and I couldn't get my work done. So uh, when I called him in, I said, you've got to give me the super user password. And he said, <coughs> well, with all due respect, sir, I uh, prefer not to give you the super user password. I said, why not? He said, well, sir, you are an internationally known expert on the theory of operating systems. <laughs> but I don't trust you for one minute fooling around with our configuration tables. You will mess up the system for everybody. And you won't even know you did it. He says, but you're the boss. If you order me to give you the super user password, I will. So uh, he did, I, I agreed with him. <laughs> so, 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 but, but, so he, he changed some of his procedures, so we made sure that the, if people came in at 7 o'clock that the systems would be booted. But the, the lesson for me that was in there was that there was a distinction between knowing about and knowing. So, and and uh, I re it really got driven home to me that there's a huge difference. And so that's what's going on here. There's a difference between people who know about programming and people who actually program well. There's people, systems thinking is different from programming. There's some people are good at this and some aren't. Some people are good at modeling, other people don't even know what the heck that means. But all computing professionals, especially the highly skilled ones, do all of these things competently. And this means that, from, from a point of view of faculty, we've got to make sure our curriculum has these things in it. A lot of our curricula have become imbalanced. They're too much on programming, in my opinion. Let me talk a little bit more about this. When we're talking about practice, I'm talking about embodied learning here. Embodied means you get it into your body. You could do it automatically and skillfully, and you could do it often without thinking. Here's some stuff we hear from, uh, you know, when, you, when you talk about, study what educators do, some of us actually do that. Um, there's uh, like these aphorisms here. We, we learn 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we see and hear, 70% of what we say, so if you teach something, you learn a lot, and 90% of what we say and do. So if we say it, and practice it with our hands or our brains, we get learn it very deeply. So learning practices is actually a way of learning deeply. Imbuing practices into curriculum significantly improves the effectiveness of our graduates. But it has to be done consciously because simply learning the principles is not going to do the job. You'll have a bunch of operating system theorists, but nobody can configure a system. When we talk about practices and embodied learning, you get into discussions like this, where you talk about level, levels of competence, beginner, advanced beginner, competent, proficient, expert, virtuoso, master, and legend, like Steve Jobs. But a lot of our students here are beginners. 
we are experts. And we sometimes forget that to get from beginner to where we are, there's a number of steps you've got to go through. So one of my favorite examples is we're expert at object-oriented programming. Our students are beginners at object-oriented programming. It's Imagine the experience if you wanted to learn how to fly. You say you go to flying school and say, I want to learn how to fly a Cessna. Simple little airplane, want to fly it. And you go to flying school and all they want to talk about is the cockpit of a 747. That's what a lot of our exper students experience when we launch into Java object-oriented programming in course one. They came in to learn how to fly a Cessna and we're hitting them between the eyes with a 747. We're trying to get them up to our level in one step and they're not ready to do it. You want to know why people disappear from the curriculum? It's because they, they say it's too damn hard. So you got to pay attention to this. How do you advance if, if they're going to be programming you want to get them up to competent level before they graduate. What's it take? How do you get them to move from beginners to advanced beginners to being competent? What does it look like for somebody to be competent and how do we measure that? And you'd be lucky if you get anybody, maybe in graduate school you can get them to be proficient. But this is where you'll get them at undergraduate level. You'd be lucky to get them to competent. But certainly not expert. You have to respect this. This is part of biological learning process. So when we're, trying to, when we're dealing with practices, it's different from educating with respect to principles. But they're obviously connected. Oh, some, of my, some of my teachers say that the ladder of competence always needs to be augmented with two other levels, the jerk and the blind man. So that if you think of this as level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this would be minus one, minus two. Uh, the blind man is a person who comes into a domain of practice and isn't even aware there's a domain of practice and just starts moving around, breaking things, doesn't even realize he's breaking things. So it's to be like a programmer who doesn't realize that there's a profession of programming. He says, don't worry, I can program anything. I did it when I was a high school kid. And the jerk is the one who's actually aware that there's a domain, but doesn't care that he doesn't know anything. So he's almost consciously making breakdowns for other people, uh, but, but has some sort of arrogance around that or something. So we actually have to deal with these two categories in real life. I just put them in there for your, for your amusement. Here's a diagram that summarizes in a kind of a map, a visual map of what I'm talking about here. We talked about principles, design and mechanics. You think of that as like one axis of a space. Here's practices. Programming systems, modeling, innovation is another dimension of the space. And the space itself is the space of things that we want to do with computation. So you would say it's filled up with applications, <coughs> all sorts of domains. And then to support these applications, we embody principles and practice into core technologies. For example, programming languages, networks, operating systems that cut across many applications. They support many applications. So what I'm getting at is that if we look at our field out here in terms of practices and principles, we can map that into core technologies, but these are more fundamental. These are going to be here in 50 years. Core technology is going to change a lot in 50 years. So um, status of this project is uh, I've been working now for three and a half years at postgraduate school on a course in, in this. We need it because many of our graduate students are coming in to computer science from other fields. But I would say about 60 to 80% of them are coming from other fields and they need some kind of roadmap because if we just, if they just came in the door and said, you've got two years to learn 30 core technologies, they'd, they'd rebel. They don't space out in the military, they simply rebel. Military coup we don't want to have happen. So uh, we've had to work very hard on the issue of how you map their knowledge, bring them in, give them a road map that they can work with and understand what's happening in their other courses. We also uh, have found that some of uh, the things that we call our fundamental principles they don't get. And you have to carefully work your way up to them. The first time I started to talk about Turing machines in the course, every computer science knows about Turing machines, I had hardly got two sentences into it. Some guy in the back row has his hand up and says, sir, that's what they say at the postgraduate school, 
they probably even say it to Dorothy. Do they say, sir, to you oh, or ma'am? Ma <laughs> 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 sir, <laughs> why are we talking about Turing machines? What's a Turing machine? I don't get it. Is that something to do with my next tour of duty? <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, the Turing machine is a fundamental concept for computer scientists. And so, well, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm a soldier. How is this going to help me in my next tour? So, uh, we had a literally, it was, fortunately, it happened at the end of the hour, the bell saved me, but we had to go rethink how our path through this so that, we, we, that the Turing machine did come up but it came up later in a discussion of the limits of computing. And by that time, they were actually interested in it. But when we just tried to jump in and said, Turing machine is a fundamental principle. It's a real cool, nifty, geeky principle. We got shot down. We also de we developed this, uh, another course we call the cornerstones of computing, which deals with the people who invented or discovered these principles. And we, we deal with it through looking through their seminal papers and having students present and talk about the personalities of these people and trying to understand the historical context in which they found themselves and the problems they were trying to deal with. And this turns out to be very inspiring for a lot of the students. We found out several students who actually wanted to change thesis topics because they found in this course, they found the area that really turned them on and it wasn't the one they had selected for their thesis. So we, we uh, learned a lot of things here. One of the things we learned is uh, beginning part of the great principle of uh, these cornerstones course, we covered a lot of the fun seminal work in programming. We wanted to start where people are already oriented. They got all excited, you know. Uh, we uh, looked up Don Knuth and Tony Hoare and Edsker Dijkstra and some of the other famous people in programming and found out all about their lives and everything. It was a very interesting discussion. Then we switched to systems, talked about some of the systems people, uh, Fred Brooks and Len Kleinrock and some of these people, they were falling asleep. Why, why, do we, why should we care about these people? Uh, Vint Cerf, Bob Kahn, why should we care about these people? They built systems, so what? Programming is more interesting. So we had to work with that and we got them interested in systems, but. We took, we said, you know, these guys came in here largely with a blank slate. And whatever they know computer science is about is what we taught them in our own curriculum. We can't say they were predisposed for mathematical stuff and against systems. In fact, we, if anything, they'd be pre predisposed towards systems because they work with systems out in the Navy and the Army and the Air Force. So we, we uh, said we had to modify. Uh, we, we talked about this with the faculty and said there's a gap someplace in our curriculum that people aren't getting. There's interesting, significant work in systems area. So we, we're we trying to work on that and reform it now. But I, I, my bet is that there's a lot of curriculum that have the same problem. We also have a, a ACM committee that's kind of looking at how we can put together a little mini library of principal stories written by people who actually helped discover these principles. Here's some of the people on the committee, so it's a good, good cross-section of people there. It's really hard to get people to write this stuff down, though, because it turns out not to be easy to write these stories, even if it was their life story. Let me say a word about the field of programmer's myth. This is a public image. What time do you want me to stop? Relatively so. Hmm? Relatively so. So five minutes, two minutes? Five, six minutes. Yeah. Okay. Public image of computing has long been a field of programmers. Back in the middle, middle 80s, I led an ACM task force that tried to reshape the way we think about curriculum. And one of the things we said in the task force report is we got to overcome this perception that CS equals programming. At that point, it was more, uh, it was more, more of a nuisance than a problem and uh, it didn't have much of an effect on how people viewed their curriculum. So most of the curriculum did not change after that. In the time we find ourselves now when enrollments have dropped significantly across the country and a lot of computer science departments are introspective and in looking at why this might be happening, now they're interested in this. Maybe there's something to this myth that's hurting us. And 
Yes, there is. I think the, in our internal view of programming, when we say, I am a programmer, we're, we're thinking of it in a very broad sense. It's the entire process of software development is kind of a big professional responsibility. The public view of programming is mostly coding. <coughs> when people are talking about this offshoring problem, they're talking about coders going to another country. But a lot of kids have this perception that if uh, you're going into computer science, you're going to be a programmer, and programmers code, and their jobs get shipped off to other countries. I'm not interested. There's no future for me in this. So uh, to me, this myth that we have is actually hurting us now. It's, Here's the student's lament down at the bottom here, but this is actually hurting us. And if we're going to attract the kind of students we want and attract a good stream of students, we're going to have to pay attention to this, that they, they hear programming in a different way than we mean programming, and we better figure out how to talk to them. So shifting this is not easy. Uh, my opinion is the Great Principles Framework can help because at least it gives you a perspective of what, what you need to look at. We certainly want to challenge the assumption that, that programming is the most fundamental or even the defining practice. This is a controversial statement. So I, I claim that in computer science, programming is one of four practices, but is not the fundamental practice and is not the defining practice. All four of them together are defining, but not any one of them. <clears throat> we also need to reorient a little bit from a notion of correctness, which is a mathematical notion. Does an algorithm fulfill its specifications? Over to the notion of fitness, which means does this system fit what the users are trying to do with it? Not the same set of measures. When we measure correctness, we're not measuring the same things as we measure with fitness. I'm not trying to say correctness is bad and fitness is good. I'm saying we're out of balance. Both algorithms and computations are subjects of, or objects of our study. Algorithms tend to be what correctness is associated with. Computations tend to go with systems, and that's what fitness is associated with. We need to uh, promote experimental methods because they are associated with large systems. There's a lot of computer science where the complexity is so high we can only approach it through experiment. And we do it all the time. But we don't take credit for it, and we don't recognize it, that we're actually doing science when we do that. And we are, in our departments, we can experiment with new organizing themes, such as organizing around a theme of innovation, or organizing around cross-discipline relationships, because we're, we're talking about interacting with other fields all the time. Or, we could talk, so there's even a few computer science departments that have organized themselves around games and virtual reality, and they're attracting students like crazy. So there are, are other organizing principles. I'm not saying that everybody want, would want to do one of these, but they give you some alternatives. So you know, it could also add to this list. You could organize around great principles, but I think you'd have to do that extremely carefully with undergraduates because they're probably not going to respond as much to the principles as they would to the practice. They want to move beyond beginner. So you've got to help them do that. But there's a lot of opportunities here by taking ideas like this and saying, how can we use them to organize it, our curriculum to meet those uh, objectives we mentioned at the very beginning? Last thing I'm going to say is that we need to learn how to tell these stories, principle stories, I call them. The first inclination is, when we talk about principles, is to try and make uh, d declarative type statements, put them in lists, and have this mechanical how it works orientation. And what works in other fields and what works with our own students is storytelling that's oriented around discoveries. Principle is part of a transformational thing. So the world was a mess before. Somebody came along with this principle, it got things organized, and now we look at systems today the world is not a mess. It's a transformational pattern in there. People get fascinated with these things. How does, how does the, the world change in the influence of ideas? Trace the evolution of the understanding of an idea. Trace the adoption of it. This is very important. If nobody adopted it, it's not a principle, is it? It's just an interesting factoid. Look at the personalities of those involved. How did, what context did they respond to when they did the discovery? People get fascinated by these stories about how people read the context and how they responded to them. 
how did they, how did these people who did this respond to opportunities and breakdowns? Is there often their personal orientation? They said, oh, you know, this, everybody else sees this as a problem. I see it as an opportunity. Everybody else sees it as a problem. I see it as a breakdown, but every breakdown is an opportunity. <coughs> and I can do something with that. So this way of thinking is always in these stories and it fascinates people. So the lesson here is if we're going to get good at talking about principle, principles oriented framework, we have to get good at principle stories that narrate transformational patterns. And these patterns, by the way, were, they exist all around us today. People are constantly engaged in innovations. That's a transformational pattern. The, we find ourselves in the middle of various messes that, that we don't know how to sort out, like the security mess, we still don't know how to sort that out, or a privacy mess, we still don't know how to sort that one out. The user interface, the GUI, I call that the GUI mess. We're still trying to sort that one out. There's lots of things around that people are trying to grapple with that look like messes and we need innovation, we need transformation, and understanding how previous one works inspires people to deal with the current, system, current situation to say, look, I find myself in a mess. That's my opportunity. Now we're out of time here, so I'm not gonna go any further than this, but I hope I've communicated the great principles idea to you and that you see some possibilities here. Thank you. Yeah. I wrote one about locality principle, which uh, was one that I worked on a lot when I was here at Purdue, and 12 of my students worked on. We learned a lot about it. This is the principle that basically says uh, computations tend to concentrate their references to, to objects, cluster them together in short intervals of time. And uh, this principle is exploited in all sorts of ways. Uh, every time you hear the word cash, somebody's exploiting the principle to make the performance of the system get better by having stored nearby the objects that are most useful to you. Google, is a, a search engine, is a giant cache of things about the internet that we can look up keywords very quickly in it. In mobile computing, we talk about bandwidth limited PDAs that you carry around with you. People are looking at how do you uh, decide what information that could be sent from the server is the most useful to what should be down here in the PDA by looking at locality based on previous uses of information down here, previous downloads, and then we know exactly what to download so the person gets what they need as fast as possible. So this principle of locality, principle of associated with the principle of caching, is a fundamental systems principle. It's got mathematical descriptions. It's being used in design all the time. And we can tell some pretty interesting stories about it. So how it got developed, different milestones in the development of it. Um, in uh, communications of ACM a few months ago, there was a, one of my IT profession columns was called the principle of locality. And if you wanted to read about that, I can give you the pointer to it. That's an example of a principal story. But you've probably seen others. You know, you'd say, uh, look at, a, say, an interview with Don Knuth and you ask him, how did you come up with LRK parsing or something? And he'll tell a little story about that and you find it pretty interesting. How did you come up with tech? What did you do there? And he'll tell you the story and he'll focus on the principles that he used to develop tech. And this is what I'm talking about, that sort of story is. It teaches you a lot, but it also inspires you. In your opinion, why aren't mechanical engineers and electrical engineers facing the same issues that we're facing with uh, offshoring? Almost all of manufacturing went overseas, and, and a lot of what has to do with engineering also went overseas. Why, not, why aren't they panicking the way that we seem to be panicking? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we're taking it too seriously. <laughs> 
maybe they don't have an enrollment drop going on. You so, you know, the, the, the offshoring thing was kind of a theoretical issue until last year or the year before when, when enrollments were going down and people started asking students, why aren't you coming? And they said, well, I don't think there's a future because the jobs are going offshore. And so that prompted the ACM to do a study of this. And basically the bottom line of the study says this is a kind of a normal natural process in international markets. <coughs> happens all the time. It's been going on for hundreds of years. And the best thing for individual computer science professionals to do is to educate, be educated, be innovative, <coughs> and be ahead of it. Uh, well, yeah. thank you all. And thanks again, Peter.